Welcome everyone to the first SAD seminar of 2022. I can't believe it. We started with SAD 2020 and then there was SAD 2021 and well, here we are in SAD 2022. Today, we're delighted to welcome Wenfei Xu for a talk on the contingency of neighborhood diversity, variations in the measurements of social context using GPS data. Wenfei is a postdoctoral fellow at the Mansueto Institute for Urban Innovation and the Center for Spatial Data Science at the University of Chicago where her research focuses on social spatial stratification, segregation, race and ethnicity, quantitative methods, and neighborhood change in the United States. Her work ranges from an interest in the historical legacies of structural housing discrimination and its contemporary spatial temporal manifestations, to exploring the uses of big data in characterizing human activity for urban social science research. We are so delighted to have you with us today, Wenfei. So before I turn the floor over to our speaker. Um, just a quick note that this is a Zoom webinar, so we'd really appreciate it if you would leave your questions and comments in the Q&A functionality down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, when Faye will talk for, I don't know, 30 to 40 minutes, and then we should have ample time for discussion afterwards, and we'll just lead with whatever questions and comments are in that Q&A. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Wen Faye. Super, thank you. All right, I'm going to try this screen sharing and get oh great I remembered awesome well first of all thank you so much levi and rachel uh for the invitation to present some of my work um it's really exciting to see the both of you um so yes again uh, uh my name is wenfei um, I'm, a, I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at the ufc and um, i'm going to talk about so my research um, and today's presentation is called the contingency of neighborhood diversity understanding uh, variations and measurements of social context using gps data uh, so i'm an urban planner and also kind of like a geographer uh, wannabe a lot of the kind of larger research questions that i'm interested in is derives from this kind of main question of what are the legacies of neighborhood disinvestment and housing discrimination on people and neighborhoods. And this generally kind of falls within two related um, research streams. The first is um, kind of looking at the legacies of mid 20th century federal housing policies. And then the second is kind of looking at um, contemporary uh, inequality. And within this kind of second stream, which is what I'm going to focus on today, um, I'm interested in questions of how we can improve our measurements of neighborhood social diversity with the larger aims of um, kind of answering this question of how, do some neighborhoods engender more diversity and why and i'll talk about some of that um, that that historical and policy and urban development context in a second uh, so a little bit of background uh, you know i, I kind of want to start from this very basic question of you know why does uh, why does neighborhood diversity actually uh, matter so we all probably tend to think that diversity is generally a positive thing but you know kind of concretely um, in terms of the actual effects and outcomes you know what you know how does neighborhood diversity affect the outcomes of people um, and so this is kind of simplifying the neighborhood effects literature like a lot, um, but I'm gonna break down kind of the neighborhood context into uh, two broad categories. The first is this kind of environmental context. Uh, so in, in your neighborhood, you have opportunities for education and employment. Um, you have amenities like uh, healthy access to healthy foods or, uh, or green space, they're kind of city services and infrastructure that also become available. So in general, kind of this environmental category are the kind of maybe physical and institutional benefits of, um, of good neighborhoods. Um, but then there are also people, right? So then there's this kind of other larger uh, category that, um, that uh, is, uh, the neighborhood context is theorized to be important. Um, you know, it's this kind of social context. Um, so what does this mean? Uh, the social context you, you know, provides you a window into the other types of lives that people may or may not have in your neighborhood. Um, our social context provides us with chance encounters, 
gatherings within a social network or just kind of like neighborhood events and gatherings. Um, so uh, within the neighborhood effects literature, there's this kind of question raised of how does neighborhood diversity actually contribute to improve social outcomes? So in other words, what's the actual mechanism through which these aspects of the neighborhood context actually translate into particular um, you know, uh, uh, outcomes and benefits? And we, you know, we're obviously kind of, a lot of this literature derives from kind of um, uh, uh, Western housing, kind of uh, post-public housing literature. So we do kind of um, care in a particular, so we care about the particular scenario of, um, you know, what are the outcomes for generally low income and minority uh, populations. So Galster and Friedrich's um, 2015 paper proposed this particular sequence as the primary uh, mechanism. So first, we have this uh, condition that creates a uh, social mix. Um, this is a condition and a social mix that we're generally able to kind of measure. And so we can create this measure of uh, diversity. And then we have then this kind of potential for social mixing, this kind of environment in this context for social mixing um, that creates a social, actual social contact, so a social interaction. And then um, this interaction kind of creates some kind of outcome. So, uh, so in other words, kind of outcomes are a consequence of exposure to social diversity. And this is the this exposure aspect of um, this mechanism is understudied, but it is theorized as the primary driver um, of diverse social contact and outcomes. Um, and obviously this mechanism, uh, you know, in urban development, this mechanism is especially, especially salient in the context of neighborhood poverty, like I mentioned before, in which concentrations of impoverishment are theorized to kind of further negatively affect individuals living in a particular neighborhood. Um, so this idea that social mixing creates better opportunities forms a lot of the basis of, you know, from the 90s up until today, it forms a lot of the basis, justified or otherwise, of mixed income and mixed tenure housing policy. And this is often kind of to replace public housing. And when we look at the existing literature on kind of the relationship between diverse environments and actual social uh, interaction, um, a lot of the literature says that, you know, Diverse areas don't necessarily translate into longer term practices or networks that integrate minorities. Um, middle class residents in gentrifying neighborhoods kind of maintain this tectonic mode of life. And I really like this term tectonic um, in that, you know, you have a spatial proximity that kind of belies a social or cultural distance. Um, Mark Joseph and John Chaskin wrote that um, the benefit of seeing a diverse of, there's a benefit to seeing a diverse range of people and lives, but this benefit might be more kind of symbolic than instrumental or material. And actually, uh, it, so in other words, it doesn't really kind of manifest in interaction. And lastly, another paper that kind of talks about how mixing itself is insufficient, but you need kind of intentional opportunities for that mixing to really stick. Um, but what's kind of common across all these different papers is that most of the studies that are interrogating kind of the nature of social interactions tend to be quite qualitative. So all of these studies are um, case studies where we're looking at a handful of neighborhoods or housing developments. Um, you know, it's generally kind of uh, conducted through interviews or ethnographic, other types of ethnographic uh, research and you, we don't have a large um, sample of, um, of 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 people in these uh, in these studies. Um, I think they're still kind of very rich in their descriptive of social mixing, but you know this can result in kind of specific conclusions. Uh, well, conclusions that are specific to kind of particular housing developments, neighborhoods, or even the people themselves. Um, on the other hand, uh, 
quantitative measures of diversity are typically based on residential census information. Um, and so this is um, a dot density map of the uh, racial and ethnic uh, population density in, uh, in Chicago. I think they're using 2016 five-year ACS. Um, but, you know, obviously this type of measurement neither captures a place specificity, nor does it capture, you know, visitors to a particular neighborhood. Um, and it definitely doesn't speak to kind of like the space time overlap that's required for uh, an actual interaction. So, uh, you know, fundamentally segregation and diversity primarily matters, as I kind of mentioned before, in how it's experienced in that kind of actual interaction that enables. So measurements of, um, you know, these measurements of segregation and diversity should moreover include a range of um, activity spaces beyond just the residential context. Um, you know, also moreover, administrative boundaries are not real, they're not perceived by residents, and so kind of trying to contain measurements within these administrative boundaries administrative boundaries doesn't necessarily make sense for that reason either. And moreover, um, the activity, uh, there's a lot of kind of variation uh, in spatial, temporal, social dynamics. And there are scholars who have found that this kind of fuller landscape of activi activity spaces results in a more kind of heterogeneous social uh, environment. So, uh, so what, to do about, uh, what to do about this kind of, um, this, this tension here? Um, you know, so one objective that I have in this study is to kind of understand how we can leverage this fine grain big spatial data to approximate kind of typically qualitative studies on behavior such as social interaction, but, you know, scaling it so that, you know, we can develop metrics that are not specific to a particular neighborhood or a particular set of people. Um, so uh, I propose that we can kind of use mobile application data to kind of to, to, to triangulate towards this type of method. So in, this, so in this study, I'm using mobile application data with approximately uh, 40 million daily pings in Chicago. That's about 300,000 users before kind of any um, data filtering. But after this pre-processing, I'm left with about 90,000 residents. I'm looking at a particular time frame between July and October uh, in 2019. And um, I've been given, uh, so the, the data provider uh, gave me uh, a data set that includes the characteristics, um, these characteristics, latitude and longitude, a point accuracy of the data, a timestamp, and a user ID. Um, so latitude and longitude, you're obviously kind of all familiar with. A point accuracy uh, tells you uh, a meter range that we uh, that we know this point is within, um, and then obviously timestamp and user ID. The median accuracy in this data set is about 12 meters, and so that is much more precise than kind of previous data sets and even previous data sets that have used um, cell phone data like CD, uh, call detail record data. Um, so before I talk about the, uh, the actual analysis, um, the first question that I think we should ask ourselves is, you know, what are the data ethics and privacy concerns of, you know, undergoing an analysis like this? Like, should we even be using the data? You know, personally, I'm pretty ambivalent for a lot of reasons. Um, but for this particular case, you know, I want to kind of try and understand what are the actual challenges to data privacy and what do I do to address this. So first, um, Cubic, you know, gave a list of the different location types, including schools, hospitals, and prisons that can't be singled out in these studies. Um, you know, the results are obscured like this or aggregated in kind of presentations and published materials. Um, and also in kind of more recent iterations of the data, um, the data provider uh, gives you a data set where the home location is um, 
is, is uh, given as a centroid of a block group. So unlike what I did in this study, you can't actually find um, the particular home locations of, um, um, of the device holders in the data set. Okay, so beyond my privacy concerns with this data, like is it actually usable? So for those of you who've worked with kind of big data sets like this, you probably know that it's extremely uh, noisy. And so, um, so here's what I did to kind of isolate the specific types of mobility patterns that I'm actually interested in studying. Um, you know, most of the data um, in this data set are pings on the road, road network. I think this is a consequence of just the type of um, applications that are in the data set and kind of like the frequency of pings that are required. So for instance, if there's kind of like a navigation app that's giving, that's providing data in this data set, it's gonna have many more and much more frequent pings um, to help uh, uh, someone navigate on the road as opposed to if um, there's a weather app in this data set and it doesn't need to collect um, data as often to kind of give you a precise understanding of what the weather is like in your area. Um, and so what I did was I removed all the points that are within a 60 foot, uh, about 20 meter diameter buffer around major streets in Chicago. And I'm all, I also removed the points that have velocities that are greater than 24 kilometers per hour. And the way that the velocities are calculated is just kind of like um, a, a distance over time, um, a pretty crude measure of distance over time between two points. And if you, um, if you look at the kind of uh, zoom in and look at the road buffers here, it looks like that um, 60 foot buffer, which I think is like a standard road distance in Chicago, kind of nicely covers uh, most of the road where there would be traffic with, um, while kind of uh, keeping other types of land uses. Um, secondly, kind of when estimating these um, home locations, uh, I'm only using those devices that ultimately are located in a residential area when I find their homes. Um, and this is just kind of like another level of, uh, and so these uh, colored areas represent all the different poss like possibilities where someone might live, where the grayed out areas are kind of a industrial, uh, entirely industrial or commercial spaces. Um, and this is just to kind of um, improve the, uh, the accuracy of the home locations. All right, so in terms of the methods that I'm actually using to find these diversity measures, um, so I propose that there are um, three contexts that are increasingly closer to measuring actual social interactions, which I call the residential, the observed, and the interaction. Uh, exposures. Um, I'm using census data to measure the residential exposure and then um, the mobile app data to measure the, uh, the observed and the interaction exposures. And I'll quickly kind of go over what each of these means. Um, so the residential exposure uh, assumes that your exposure is what's implied by your place of residence according to the census. So not only does it not measure the realized kind of day-to-day -day context, um, but this is an equally likely um, scenario um, if we're looking at exposure on the um, on a administrative boundary context. Um, so, arguably, uh, you know, this scenario is much less uh, or is less diverse kind of than this previous one. Um, the, ex the observed exposure is all the activity that we actually see in a census block group across a whole period of analysis. So in other words, there's no temporal specificity to this. Um, I think this is a type of social context that's more realistic perhaps, and it, I think it's also what's been used by some of the recent um, mobile app papers. And finally, uh, the interaction exposure introduces a, uh, a space-time component to ask when people actually have the opportunity to come into uh, contact when, uh, with one another. Um, so at some point in time, the neighborhood interaction context can be this, 
um, it can be that at other points and maybe uh, that as well. Uh, so the measure that I'm uh, using to understand exposure to racial diversity is, um, so, you know, it's derived from this question of what's the probability that any two randomly selected people in a social spatial context are, uh, are not in the same group. Um, in this case, a group means kind of different race and ethnicity groups. And it's this change in the spatial unit or the context that actually changes uh, this measure. So in terms of the met methodological precedents, um, Wong and Shaw have a good paper that creates a measurement based on activity spaces, which they use uh, travel, I think travel diaries to demonstrate. Um, this exposure measure is based on Lieberson's exposure measure. Um, uh, obviously kind of like the space time prison or volume is like not a new concept in geography. Um, Farber and all at all and colleagues um, use origin destination pairs to identify social interaction potential through intersections of two uh, space time prisons prisons here. Um, so my measure uh, uses the uh, the Simpson index. Um, this measure is finding group A's probability of encountering a member of group B in a geographic unit uh, I. So this index is, uh, I think, is interesting because, or it's useful because it's agnostic to boundaries of area units and the number of groups in the comparison. Um, and um, essentially what the formula is, is this one minus uh, isolation, which is the probability of picking two people from um, the same group. And so in this particular equation here, um, we have a diversity index uh, measure for every particular every particular um, unit that we're looking at. Um, so here, uh, the unit is a census block group. Um, I'm looking, M is the, uh, the racial and ethnicity group here. I'm looking at four groups, Asian or non-Hispanic, Asian, non-Hispanic, Black. Um, I, I never fix this, but this is supposed to be Hispanic and then non-Hispanic white. And um, YMI is the uh, estimated population for unit I and for group M, and then YI is the estimated population for unit I. And so this is a measure um, that has a range of zero to, in this case, um, 0 0.75, because I'm subtracting uh, self-exposure or, or isolation. Um, so I didn't actually, so after I did all the calculations, I realized that the actual Simpson diversity index is this formulation where you, uh, you're not just squaring the counts, you're uh, multiplying n by n minus one. So then I think the measure actually goes from zero to one, but you know, it's the same idea. So the observed exposure is, uh, isn't just the exposure of the block group, uh, of all the stays within the block group over time. Uh, again, though, um, although these are observed and like spatially dynamic, it's still a static measure and it doesn't consider time. Um, the weights here are a population weight as each person in the data will represent kind of like a weighted count of their residential neighborhood population. And then finally, the interaction exposure um, calculates the exposure of at least two people who have an overlap in space and time. Um, and uh, so this is kind of this first, uh, this first formula here. And then uh, for ease of comparison, I ultimately aggregate these exposures to the, the block group level. Um, so with each measure, again, because each person in the data represents a weighted count of their residential uh, population uh, or the, the neighborhood that they came from, um, the aggregation to the block group level, as well as this kind of cluster level um, exposure measure gets, um, gets weighted. And so uh, by the way, the, I'll explain, I'll kind of illustrate this more in a second, but the, I'm, I'm using a 10 meter radius and a five minute window to create these clusters. And the clusters have to have more than two people. <laughs> 
Um, and, and so I have a hypothesis about kind of the distribution and kind of like the general uh, modes of these three different exposure measures. And the hypothesis is that kind of using uh, the baseline, uh, the residential exposure as the baseline, the observed exposure is generally going to be higher than the residential exposure. And that's only because, you know, it captures a wider range of activities and contexts and people throughout the period, including the residential context. Um, but based on the kind of um, previous qualitative work that I've described, that you know, there's not actually a lot of meaningful interaction um, in a neighborhood despite, you know, um, despite diversity. I'm going to hypothesize for this paper that um, the opportunities for interaction are actually less diverse um, than what the, uh, the residential diversity measure suggests. Um, okay, so how am I looking at individuals' activities and locations? Um, I think uh, unlike in most of these kind of cell phone or mobile phone data studies, I don't actually want to look at all the data, um, just those times when someone is actually staying in a place. Again, the idea being that like, you know, if you're in transit, you're likely in a car in Chicago, you're probably not going to meaningfully contribute to your social context, and you're probably not going to have a lot of opportunities to interact with people while um, you're in transit. Um, and so uh, what do I do here? I'm uh, finding the uh, I'm finding the points that cluster in space and how this clustering is done is dependent on whether I'm looking for the user's home location or just an activity space. Um, the centroid of these points will then be registered as the actual location. So for home locations, I'm using a 150 meter DB scan clustering radius and I'm looking only at the activities between 1 and 5 a.m. and I should say that's on a weekday. And then uh, for the state locations, I'm also using DB scan, um, but this time a, a 10 meter a clustering radius and the pings have to be within uh, five minutes of each other. And so this is just an example of a, um, a potential user path where, you know, if they're kind of in transit, um, they're, pro they're not, this, this data is not going to be recorded. And then once they kind of stay in a particular location, if there is enough data and the data is close enough to each other, it gets registered as a, um, as a stay and the centroid is then um, recorded. So for home locations, um, if, you know, what if multiple points come up as potential home locations, uh, what I'm doing is I'm just gonna cluster these multiple different potential home locations and keep the highest count cluster as the user's actual home. Of course, this will um, not matter as much in future studies where um, I will not be calculating a user's home location by myself. Um, and so what are the opportunities for interaction? When there are at least two people who overlap in space and time in their stays, that is when they're within, uh, when their pings are within 10 meters and five minutes of each other, um, this is counted as an interaction opportunity. So overall, I only found that there are about 30,000 uh, interactions across the entire period with a typical range of two to four people within each cluster. So it's not a wildly large number of interaction opportunities. And I think uh, ultimately, you know, that's not really the goal. Um, you know, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to kind of take advantage of the volume and density of this data to find these tighter bandwidths that are more realistically looking at possibilities for interaction. I think um, how this study is maybe different from some of the more recent studies looking at diversity and segregation using big data is that these other studies have a much larger bandwidth that probably approximates uh, something more on the neighborhood level rather than what I'm kind of interested in. Um, so if, you, if we look at, you know, kind of the bandwidth of most of these studies, 100 meter, 150 meters, 200 meters um, block group level, uh, doesn't quite get to, you know, what we would consider like an interaction potential yet. Um, and then kind of secondly, how do we find um, the demographic breakdowns for these different users in order to kind of understand diversity? So there are three steps. 
Um, first, I'm kind of predicting residential population from these derived home locations. I'm going to re-weight re the representation of the mobile app data accordingly, and then I'm going to create a probabilistic demographic profile for the users um, in this data set. So again, um, I'm fine. So in the first step, um, predicting the residential populations from the derived uh, home locations, I'm finding these um, home locations that are stays between 1 to 5 a.m. and, you know, the clusters with the most stays. Um, once I have these home locations, I can join them back to census block groups and check um, the representativeness of the data. So uh, after kind of some of the filtering steps that I talked about earlier, and then after filtering for some extremely high density uh, counts at all hours of the day, uh, mainly at airports and kind of downtown, the correlation between the log mobile app population density and the log census population density is uh, 0.83, which is high um, enough. And um, modeling this relationship also produces kind of decent adjusted R squares of around 0.8 to 0.84, depending on the model. Um, so when I try to model the mobile app population density, just to get a sense of its bias, its possible biases, I find that black percentage and higher education percentage positively predicts mobile app population density. And so this is something that I'm going to adjust for in the final uh, population density model, where I'm including the cell population and population density, as well as these two factors of black percentage and higher ed percentage as predictors. Um, I actually found that even when I don't include these two, I still get an unbiased estimate of the residential population, which is great. But adding these two extra covariates basically just um, uh, increases my uh, adjusted R squares. So um, I guess you know the 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 punchline in this slide is that we have uh, we have what seems like a normally distributed um, set of residuals. And finally, um, you know while the predicted population on average might be unbiased, there's kind of still block group level variance. And so each each particular census block group may be over or underrepresented. And so I'm going to use the predicted log density from the app data and reweight uh, uh, the population. And um, here is a image of the distribution of weights. Obviously, um, it's going to be centered around one because we have this uh, unbiased prediction. And most of the weights are between 0.5 and 1.5. Um, so these charts show the resulting distribution of um, the population demographic and socioeconomic profiles of the census data, which is in red here, and then the mobile application data, which is in blue. Overall, um, it looks pretty good as a representation of the residential population, especially in the race and ethnicity categories. Um, and then lastly, um, I'm creating this probabilistic demographic profile. And I think, again, kind of what's um, different, uh, you know, how my, how this study is different from some of the previous um, cell phone data studies is that I, I think they mostly use um, the dominant group as to represent um, um, the, the race of a particular person, whereas um, I'm trying to kind of lessen the ecological fallacy issue and uh, to do this, each resident uh, in the mobile application data set is given this probabilistic demographic profile um, that's tied to their home location. So for instance, um, if I'm a resident of um, this particular area in Hyde Park, which I am, um, my, I, I'm not sure what the actual uh, uh, racial breakdown is, but for instance, if the racial breakdown of this particular block group is 75% white, 10% black, 5% Asian, and 10% Hispanic, then I have a likelihood, that, that is my likelihood, uh, or my, my probabilistic demographic profile. Um, and I think that um, kind of, because Chicago is so racially segregated, um, this distinction may have actually led to clearer uh, calculations in some of my exposure uh, measures. Okay, so uh, let me talk about the results very quickly. 
Um, so here's what the results look like. On the left here is this um, baseline residential exposure to racial diversity. You know, it kind of reflects what we know about Chicago's patterns of segregation. So there's like nothing new here. The South Side has this kind of large swath of low exposure due to its racial segregation. Um, and this is Hyde Park. Obviously, Hyde Park is more diverse. Um, and West Side of the city is um, similarly racially segregated, um, which also kind of implies low residential exposure. Um, this middle chart here shows how much higher uh, or lower the observed exposure was to the residential one. So the more blue, um, the more blue uh, uh, this coral plus is, the higher the observed exposure wa was in comparison to the residential exposure. And then red means that the exposure was lower. So you can see here that almost the entire city is blue or grayish, meaning um, uh, a based on the kind of observed exposure, um, the, the observed exposure was kind of higher in almost all parts of the city compared to um, the residential one. So this confirms the first part of the hypothesis, right, that the observed exposure is going to be higher than the residential one. Um, what I also think is especially interesting is that the south and west side of the cities um, stand out, meaning we're especially underestimating the exposure to diversity in these kind of residentially segregated neighborhoods. Um, lastly, um, this chart or this map here on the right hand side shows the interaction exposure is more heterogeneous than um, the observed exposure, which is, I think, to be expected. And it actually confirms um, some of the previous findings by other researchers that in reality, when we look at, you know, the wider activity space landscape. It's going to be more heterogeneous. Um, I think what's interesting is that, you know, the south and the west sides of the city, they're not these like diversity deserts either. Um, there's like pockets of high exposure, there are pockets of very low exposure that I think could warrant um, um, more investigation perhaps through kind of mixed methods means. Um, when we look at the distribution of these different exposure measures, you can see that the median value of the interaction exposure is around 0. Uh, 0. 0.44, which means that there's on average a 44% probability that any two people selected within an interaction cluster are of different races. And this is actually still a lot higher than the residential levels. Um, However, there's like a degree, a, a large degree of overlap across all three exposure measures as shown by um, the correlations, uh, the correlations here. So this suggests that the residential context still really matters in, um, and it's an important uh, factor in determining exposures across a broader range of activities and contexts. And this kind of makes sense, right? Um, it's probably because residents like extend their activities most frequently to places in and around their home locations. Um, and this is what the distribution of the three measures look like. Um, this red here is a residential exposure. It has a lot of mass near zero, which we kind of already knew. Um, however, the observed, uh, which is um, this green line here and the interaction exposures, which is this blue line here, have the bulk of their mass closer to kind of the maximum exposure level, which I found quite surprising. Okay, so again, some of like the key takeaways, I think this study strongly suggests that there's a lot of value in, um, in using these dynamic data sources as a complement to a kind of our existing understanding of demographic stratification. Um, the observed exposure shows that the actual like static social context of a neighborhood is much more diverse than what the residential context suggests. And this um, has been confirmed by some of the other studies that are, uh, that are kind of looking at uh, measures more similar to the observed exposure. While on the other hand, um, the, uh, I think I left out a slide here, but on the other hand, um, the interaction exposure is, is still higher than the residential exposure, which I was surprised about. And then uh, lastly, there's obviously some temporality in the data because I'm looking at, you know, the month between uh, July and October, a lot of temperature changes in Chicago. You can tell that you know by October 
the activity, the density of the activity really dips here. Um, and, uh, and there's kind of some like differences between, um, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and some of the weekday uh, activities as well. And then lastly, you know, this is kind of what the interaction exposures look like when they're just aggregated. So I was kind of curious to get a better understanding of where these clusters are. So here um, I selected some large clusters. Of course, I don't think it's surprising that many of them are, you know, airports, sports arenas, or kind of high density residential areas, which I actually think points out a flaw in this method because I'm not accounting for um, the z-axis distance. Um, but I think also not surprisingly, there are some um, under-researched areas in the segregation literature, um, which are, you know, maybe these kind of retail spaces. So this is like a Costco, a Target, a Jewel Osco, um, some kind of like larger retail chains for groceries and home goods. And then what are what do these spaces actually kind of look like, you know, in real life? Um, I just want I just like wanted to get a sense of of that um, just as kind of like a way of kind of ground truthing or sanity check. So this is one of the clusters. It's kind of a a, a strip mall, and um, the data proposes that um, kind of this parking lot is an area of potential social interaction. This is another one. Um, a beach on the north side of Chicago, um, the space outside of a church on the south side of Chicago. Um, so yeah, so kind of as I mentioned before, this, this interaction exposure, exposure is not really lower than the, um, the residential exposure. Um, and then lastly, um, I'm kind of hoping to put some of the aggregated results on a website so that um, that people can explore some of the data and kind of uh, look at you know look at what you know where these areas of potential high interaction might be. Um, so in terms of the limitations and uh, next steps, I think there are a lot of limitations to the study and maybe to the data itself. You know, first of all, these are not interactions; they're only kind of opportunities for interaction. I don't think the data is quite precise enough to, for instance, tell us whether or not these clusters are inside or outside or at a specific uh, location. Um, I didn't weight the diversity measures for the time overlap, um, and I wonder how that changes the, the measures. But then kind of the most important um, limitation, I think, and what will be um, kind of the next step in this research are, are the days themselves actually representative. So we know that we can model um, the residential population. Um, but you know, when I look at the activity spaces and the, um, and the data that's supposed to represent human mobility, um, do we have a good sense of whether or not they're representing, uh, you know, they're in, in an unbiased or kind of like a random representation of human activity? Or um, does the, you know, or are there certain types of biases towards uh, you know particular types of activity spaces or particular types of locations um, so you know furthermore um, what type of social dynamic do these interaction clusters truly represent um, you know kind of going back to this uh, to this uh, parking lot example you know the data shows that there is a cluster here that represents an opportunity for social interaction but really are you going to have an interaction with somebody as you're kind of walking to your car maybe maybe not um, and I think that you know that that's a, um, a a very large question that hasn't really been answered by uh, most of the scholars that are um, that are using this data set yet so this will be kind of like the next steps of my study is to, um, to potentially do um, some field work or mixed methods analysis that, that is trying to kind of tackle this particular question. And then obviously in the long run, um, I do want to then um, get a better understanding of whether or not we can use these measures to answer these larger questions of you know, neighborhood diversity and whether or not certain policies in certain types of neighborhoods engender more diversity, more social, uh, social interaction. And then, um, and then lastly, kind of why, uh, why this is the case.
Uh, so uh, that's that's it. Um, I think I kind of went over time, but um, uh, I guess we have some we have time for questions. Yeah, we have plenty of time for questions. Thank you so much. So what I'm going to do is start with the um, questions that are already in the Q&A. So if you want to leave a question there, that's fine. But I'm sure that Levi and I also have plenty of questions. I'm never short on things to ask. Um, so just having a look at the Q&A, uh, Alon Kahani asks about the demographics for the data, which I think you then went into after the question had been put into the chat. Um, but the, the question follows on by saying, uh, on Chetty's works, there's an emphasis on children and under 18s. And I suppose really to expand, the question is sort of, have you thought about looking at particular um, subgroups within the sort of total population to look at maybe how this might vary across different groups? You focus on, on race, which I think we tend to do in the US context, but age is actually yeah. really interesting also. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. And I think, you know, for the next, so definitely in the next um, steps of this research, I'm going to look at um, socioeconomic breakdowns and the intersection of race and um, and and income, for instance, or maybe like home value. And and yeah, and that is kind of particularly um, important in kind of like the U.S. or North American context. One thing that I would say about this data, right, because it represents um, you know people who have a smartphone you're probably going to like systematically exclude certain groups. So one example would be probably the elderly who um, may not have a smartphone or may not be able, you know, it may not be as mobile, right? Um, and so I think that, you know, I think that probably we're excluding, we're systematically excluding those populations as well as kids who don't have smartphones. Um, and so even though we can kind of calculate this like unbiased like residential population across the whole population, I think when you actually kind of look at the um, like breakdowns in particular groups, you, you have to kind of um, just allow for the reality that this data will, you know, is limited in a lot of ways. And one of the ways is that we're probably not gonna, we're probably excluding certain types of populations who don't own smartphones. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, the next question is from Laura Vaughn, who says, I really enjoyed your conceptualization of this sort of analysis as measuring the opportunity for interaction with people from other demographic groups ra rather than the standard measure purely of residential diversity. I wonder if it would be possible in your data to differentiate between types of streets where observed exposure occurs, for example, to weight streets that are more likely to be used regularly by people for local trips and thus to build up a measure of familiarity with people um, from other groups. That's a really nice suggestion. Yeah, I think I think maybe what you're suggesting is also kind of like the creation of like a network or to kind of take this data to understand kind of like the larger networks of um, of, of interaction of kind of shared um, shared like spaces that people visit. I I think it's I think it's something that um, the people have uh, like I think there's some researchers at University of Wisconsin. Their like geographic data science lab or something um, have done like look at the social networks, um, the the breakdown of social networks and whether or not people of different races are kind of um, engaging with one another. Like kind of what the what that social network looks like, the groups of social networks. Um, but I haven't um, I haven't I haven't done that type of research. I have a um, potential project with some transportation researchers where we are gonna are gonna like look at the data that I haven't looked at here, which is like all the transportation data and try and get a better understanding of kind of like the racial composition of particular street segments in uh, in American cities and kind of relate that to um, for instance, like um, police stops to understand, you know, the racial breakdown of roads and maybe um, um, like kind of public transit areas and whether or not they're more or less conducive to um, to to um, kind of what we consider like like racialized um, police activity or what might be racialized police activity. That's interesting because I was thinking about it in a different way, which was you know if you sort of link the way we think about diversity and segregation um, 
if you link it to sort of occupational segregation, for example, I think you could, you know, if you could look at the types of places, and you, you show this with some of the, if it's an airport or a grocery store, for example, where you could probably make the argument that people are indeed in the same space, but it's like the parking lot. There's somebody checking your groceries out and there's somebody buying the groceries. And it, that is certainly a sort of interaction, but it's a different kind of interaction and probably not the kind of creative potential interaction that we're hoping for, right? In fact, it's probably reinforcing structural inequalities in some ways. And so that if you could even go down to buildings or street segments, you could probably say something about the, the kinds of places where you get these sort of, where the interactions occur and what that might mean. I, I, yeah, yeah, I think, I think that's, I think that's a really, I think that's a, like a good suggestion and I would love to like kind of do like a land use like a land use analysis across these different types of clusters um or like kind of break it down by like land use or like maybe something even more specific I do I do kind of hesitate a little bit just because I know that like the data isn't precise enough to say like well they're in that building or they're in that shop, you know, they're in that particular store in the shopping mall. Um, but, you know, I mean, you know, people like other, other, other studies have done this where they've kind of associated like, you know, locations to, um, or they've associated the data to a particular location. I think they use like pretty big buffers. Um, so I'm always like a little bit hesitant to do that because I feel like, I don't know, like, I don't, I don't know what that really big buffer means or what it kind of, what it captures or what it like leaves out. Um, so I, to, to, to associate it with particular locations, I might be a little bit challenging, but you know, I'm sure there are ways to think about it. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I, can, I don't want to hog the airtime because I can see we have more questions that have come in. So Charles Zhao asks if you're going to share your data in addition to publishing your results. That's a quick one. Um, I can share the results. I am not allowed to share the data. Um, the data is proprietary to um, the yeah the the provider, and it has like you know individual locations. So um, for like a lot like a lot of privacy reasons, in addition to like private data provider trying to make money reasons, I'm not allowed to share the data, unfortunately. All right. And Jamie Sims asks, would these data offer the opportunity to investigate green space or outdoor space exposure, but in terms of direct access, so addressing geographic uncertainty and indirect nearness, for example, air quality, um, and, and that this could also include interactions in green space for the social element? Great question. Um, because uh, because uh, I originally started uh, working with this data while I was a data scientist at a tech startup called Cardo. And the first project that we did was looking at green spaces in New York and kind of looking at where people went, the social interaction potentials of these green spaces. And um, there's actually a website where we visualize some of the data. I think if you Google a million walks in the park, Cardo and a million walks in the park, you can find that um, kind of web uh, web tool where you can play around with some of the data. So yes, I have um, looked at kind of green spaces and in the context of um, in the context of, of, of um, like social interactions before. Um, in in terms of like their indirect nearness, so kind of access. Um, like nearness to like air quality, I think that um, it seems like a kind of easy and logical extension of this like more specific um, analysis of like clusters within a park. So yeah, very possible. Uh, haven't done the indirect nearness studies. And Ying Zhao asks, um, can, well, data set may be public, we already covered that. Are there big data sets, GPS or mobile time series, like this that are public and free and can be used to study interesting patterns in addition to the interaction patterns you've studied here? There are, I mean, Levi might also, you or Levi might also know the answers to these questions. I think there was like a Microsoft one in Beijing where um, they, it's, it's not like mobile app data, but they, you know, they got a set of users to basically just wear mobile uh, GPS devices um like across some period of time so i think there are a lot of papers um using that data set because it is open or somewhat easily accessible um 
Yeah, Beijing and Will says Beijing taxi trajectories um, are another one. Um, yeah, there aren't too many I, I, other than those that I'm aware of. <laughs> like, there's the Danish student survey, right, which is social networks in space. Uh, in COVID. Yeah. Very few, I think, that are big and diverse in that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I will say um, a good thing is that, you know, I think a lot of these data providers, um, you know, are happy to partner with, um, you know, academic researchers because it provides them kind of like a dual purpose of demonstrating particular case studies of their data, but then also, um, you know, kind of I'm, I'm working with this cubic data in their data for social good. Um, their data for social good program and so you know it also kind of um um you know it's it's good marketing for them right <laughs> well i have a question but i want to turn it over to levi first in case he had anything he wanted to ask yeah um i one thing that i i find kind of really fascinating about this stuff is that um you know, geographers oftentimes look at segregation as a counting exercise, trying to figure out how to summarize and, and describe the structure of, it, of a social space. But you connect it really strongly to like a process, right? Like healthy, diverse neighborhoods. And I was wondering um, if you can speak to how it's different to talk about racial integration versus integration of a neighborhood community, right? Like when people interact, a diverse neighborhood probably has interactions inside of the neighborhood but also residents of that neighborhood interacting outside of the neighborhood, right? You know, two people might meet at a coffee shop on the north side, not where they're from, but they're still in the same neighborhood. So I was wondering, do you see any kind of social network analysis in the future of this kind of research program? Yeah, so I think it, that's a, I mean, it also kind of speaks to, again, the kind of one of the previous questions where I was thinking about like how interesting, it, yeah, it could be to kind of link this to social networks, because I've made the argument that this is kind of like an egocentric approach to understanding, you know, social interaction, you know, social interactions, right, diverse social interactions, but it is kind of like egocentric limited to a particular space. Whereas if you, I think, you know, another approach could be kind of just following, a, you know, just following the person across, you know, across their day, across the weeks and developing an analysis from kind of that perspective and having an entirely egocentric approach. Um, and, and, you know, so to, to answer your question, um, yes. And I think a lot of the especially a lot of this kind of like activity space and the sociology literature does talk about how, you know, we cross all these different, you know, our, our exposures are crossing all these different boundaries. You know, we're, we're going to work, we're going to school, we're meeting kind of other people. And so we, we still kind of in our quantitative methods don't have like a nearly robust enough um, way to understand that yet. Um, you know, I think I keep on saying like, you know, there's way more to be done with this data and there's like way more to be done with this data. Now that I'm like done with the pesky three papers, also known as my dissertation, I'm going to be able to focus more on, um, not pesky, it was great, but like I'm going to be able to kind of focus more on these um, kind of more like, like deeper questions, I think. It does remind me of the third place as the site of most kind of social right. interactions. There's right. Some fascinating stuff there. So. Right. Okay, it's the top of the hour, so I'm going to hold my questions, but I will close by saying thank you again to Wenfei. This was fantastic. And I really appreciate all the audience attention and the discussion. And just to say that we have another talk coming up in early February, Kate Robinson from University of Liverpool, and an interview also in February with Trisilla Nelson from UC Santa Barbara. So it's a busy spring term for the SAD seminars. Um, but thanks again, Wenfei, and thanks to everyone for being here, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you all.